Hello, Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Today's date, it's March 20th of uh, 2019. If you watched my last video, you would be expecting to hear me using this microphone. I hooked it up and it was I was getting distortion and uh, problems with it. I messed with it a little bit, but I did not mess with it uh, a lot. Let me see if I can uh, crank the volume up here and let you hear what it sounded like when I just tried it and then I disconnected it. Uh, let's see, what would that be? That would be in this folder here. And it would be this one here. Not sure if I've got the vibe. Well, we'll see here, won't we? Three, two, one. Ouch. So, back using the headphones. Um... I can't believe we're already having town hall meetings with, you know, the election is so far away. We have all these people already declaring for the election, already doing this crap. Wish it was some, but the system needs to be redesigned, overhauled, uh, changed. No, I'm not advocating a, a dictatorship for the proletariat. I'm not calling for us to... Uh, throw out the Constitution or anything, just update it, change it, and fix it. There are things wrong with it. Uh, so, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas uh, has asked a question for the first time in three years. The justices on our Supreme Court, when they're hearing cases, there's, you know, the, there's very, I think, I'm thinking that it's very formal, very structured. Uh, and it's my understanding that it, I'm not sure how it works on the schedule, but the justices are all there. And there's a time frame when the attorneys for each side present their case and the justices will ask questions. Uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, Clarence Thomas, rarely ever ask a question, which is really strange and unusual. Um, so anyway, he asked a question, I guess, uh, many, many years ago, but it was quite a few years after Clarence Thomas was approved uh, for the Supreme Court. I was watching C-SPAN. Yes, there's people that actually watch C-SPAN. If you're in another country, uh, C-SPAN uh, televises Congress. The cameras run all the time that it Congress is in session, even when actually, well, it's in session, but there's, and the Republicans started, uh, with, and I don't think the Democrats have followed, uh, of uh, there had to be a presiding officer, and uh, uh, somebody will show up and just uh, propagandize, uh, you know. And uh, nobody wants, I mean, it's just, the place is empty, and it goes into the record, you know, and that, and I guess they get to see the people back home who don't care, who don't watch C-SPAN either. It's kind of a joke that people don't watch C-SPAN. Actually, C-SPAN has some accent, but they don't all just broadcast Congress. They have other interviews. Uh, they go to various places, the presidents, where the presidents' libraries are. They go. They just do a lot of material, and they have some great interviews because uh, when they interview somebody, they're not limited to 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. 
and they do some fantastic interviews with a lot of different people. So I'm joking. Uh, although I don't, well, I guess I would online. I don't watch C-SPAN now, but I uh, did in the past when I had cable, uh, all the cable channels. And one of the things that I saw was Justice Clarence Thomas. Okay, you have to remember, maybe you don't remember this. Uh, Anita Thomas I worked in his office in some capacity when he was a federal judge or something. And then when he was nominated for the United States Supreme Court, she came forward with accusations of inappropriate behavior on his part. And it, and he was nominated by a Republican president, and it became a really divisive thing that uh, the Republicans haven't forgotten. I mean, it's like... Yeah, I don't know how many years it's been, 20, 30 years or whatever, and they were really upset. And then the way uh, Anita Thomas was cross-examined and by the Republicans upset women and other people. So it was just a, a very divisive thing. Uh, anyway, uh, Thomas... Justice Thomas was approved for the court, and uh, I saw on C-SPAN many years ago, he, he uh, one of the things, now he's not the only one that, they, they do, you know, the justices do think, well, one thing, they write books, and that's an extra way for them to make, make money, you know, but... Um, because there's a lot of things, because they're a judge, they can't go out and do, but they can write books. And uh, I'm not sure if they get paid. They probably get paid also when they, if they go out and make a appearance someplace before a group. So anyway, anyway, uh, but what he was doing, I'm sure he wasn't being paid for. It was a group, I think of, it was, uh, I think high school kids who were in Washington, D.C. And it was a small number of them, but like a class, and uh, so they they get to meet a United States Supreme Court justice and talk to him and ask him questions. And he, it was many years after this contentious hearing before he was approved, many years after that. And he brought it up and mentioned it and how... Uh, forget how I put it. It's been a long time ago. I can't remember it. But I was very sympathetic to him because you could tell. I mean, he brought it up after all these years. And, I mean, it's, but still, after all these years, that has got to. So he's been damaged by it, hurt by it. And Anita Thomas, the uh, woman from his office, has been devastated by it too and so what a mess but I was impressed by his honesty and his humility and uh, whatever and I have some sympathy for him uh, but he is a conservative uh, justice on the court and he I think he either he told his history or I mean, he uh, yeah, okie doke, I'm not to feed the cat, um, but in my opinion, he, he's, you know, he's a black man, he did not grow up rich, he got ahead by, you know, hard work, scholarship, all that type of stuff. And uh, I wish he voted on some key issues in the more progressive, liberal position than he does. But uh, 
Anyway, he has spoken. He's asked a question. I guess we should see why. I didn't intend. By the way, I have no script, as you can tell. Uh, he asked a question. One of his exceptional rare queries involved race. But as he happened before, it was at the Twitter. Thomas, only the second African-American justice in history, has gone for years at a, a stretch without a... A moment at the U.S. Supreme Court today. Justice is considering a case involving racial bias. Oh, I think actually the... I'm not sure if this browser does. I think the other... I think uh, one of the other browsers, I have a setting where I can... I just hate that. When I go to see an ad, if I want to watch video or whatever... I'll go to YouTube or something. When I go here uh, to CNN's website, I mean, I'll watch CNN on TV or I'll call it up on the audio up on the, I, I can say Echo because I have this thing set to Alexa. Um, anyway, um, Uh, let's see. On the occasion of his voice being heard, it's often related to race, but with a counterintuitive thrust, as occurred in the new dispute over a Mississippi prosecutor's repeated elimination of blacks from a jury pool. Thomas has given many explanations for his singular silence through the years including that he believes the justice should just try to get the answers at the lectern more time to present their, or the judge, the lawyers at the lectern to get, have more time to, uh, it's been a long time since I've heard the word lectern or used it. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember this from his thing now. He, he earlier referred to his youth in Pinpoint, Georgia, where he developed a dial, uh, dialect, he said, was mocked. And Thomas has said that gave him the habit of listening more than speaking. Yeah, that's one of the things, like when I watched that thing of him, that made me... Uh, Thomas employs a distinctive conservative approach that puts him on the far right of the generally conservative Supreme Court. And so da da da. Well, anyway, I'm not going to. I guess I'll put the link here in case you're. In case I. Uh, got you interested, which I'm sure I didn't. Um, I'm just going to be rambling. So if. Uh, if you don't like these ones where I just ramble and get lost in my. And have to ask you, what was I talking about? Um, I'm going to, let's see, images. No, that's not where it is. Yes, it is there, but I think I put it someplace else. It's, I think, PDF files. Uh, no, I think it was in that file. Images. Yeah, I think it here. It is uh, scan. Okay. Man, full screen. Loading. Let's see, I can minimize that a little bit. Uh, I wonder if I click to the side if it brings up. Nope, it doesn't. Um, scan one. I think this is scan two. There we 
we go. Of course, over here is about my bulletin board system. The Discless VBS, Howard's Notebook. This is from 1984, by the way. I'll have to go to the third page here to... Uh, uh, I'll go ahead and do that now. And... Which one is the third one? Uh, I don't know which one. Oh, I think it must be this one. That'll be the last few lines of it. Nope. Oh, to heck with it. Uh, maybe I'll put it at the end. No, I don't know what I'm going to do. What was I talking about? I think I was just saying I was just going to uh, ramble and talk. I... Uh, was watching something earlier today. I think I was reading uh, quota questions. I think that was it. And I was thinking how lucky I was. I'm, I'm going to be, I think, 78 this month. And that's sort of got me thinking also about another thing. I need a place to write. I need, like, a large tablet that'd be here someplace so I could mark down a note on it. I guess that's what paper's for, right? Thinking how lucky I was that all my life I always had a job and often I had two jobs at the same time and uh, how hard it must be now for younger people and for even older people if you're working to have a job or be or to be worried about. I mean, I I quit some jobs and was working the next day, or quit a job on Friday, and had a I quit the post office, I believe it was. I took the test for postal clerk, passed, went to work for the post office, didn't like work for them for a few months, didn't like working for them, and told them I was quitting, and they were saying, this is a career civil service job. You're quitting it? And I said, yes, and I quit. had a job Monday welding. Uh, and I quit other, other, you know, I went one place as a welder to go to work. They said, okay, you got the job, you know, uh, that tank, you know, these trucks that pull the tanks behind them on the things, uh, crawl inside there and weld up the seams or whatever. And I remember telling before this story someplace in one of my videos here, and I said, well, you need to get some air in there and get, the, you know, some fan sucking the, you know. And the other guys I worked with said, oh, what you need to do is be sure and drink lots and lots of milk when you go home. Drink a lot of milk to get this galvanized metal or whatever, I forget what it was, out of your system or whatever. But anyway, I told the the boss or whatever, when I come in tomorrow, you need to have fans and air and airline going in there or else. And so I came back the next day and he didn't. So I said, goodbye. And I did, I got fired, let's see, one time. Seems like it should be two. I got fired one time. I was ready to be fired. I think I've sort of told that story before. Not the entire story, but um, I was happy to go. And then I, even though, and then I had a job immediately. Uh, I think that's when I went to work for Radio Shack as a manager trainee. Oh, there's another job, but I quit because they promised me. I went to work, I hired in to go to work in their computer store. They had, 
that was the second computer store they had opened in Kansas City. And then the general manager didn't want to hire me for that. He wanted to hire me to be manager of a store. And I told him, no, no, no. And then he said, what if we, and I, he said, is there any way we could get you to take, you know, a manager's position? We need managers. I said, no, there's no way. I know. I've been, I've bought a ton of your products. I've gone into, you know, your stores and I know how you treat your employees and your managers, especially. And he said, what if we had a, you know, I said, is that the store that's under construction at Cedar Tree Square out in Belton? He says, yes. He said, if we're going to, you know, it's going to be opened up here soon. Would you take that? That was a few blocks away from where I lived. I said, I'd take it. And then it turned out <laughs> after I went to a Bannister Mall store, brand new mall just opened. I was a manager trainee or whatever. And uh, the general manager gave that store in my hometown to a, another Radio Shack employee. And I, you know, the other Radio Shack employee lived out there too. I didn't know it at the time. And he was already a manager. He was a manager and everything. I understand fully, except, to, you know, so I quit that. But anyway, after I was fired from this uh, hospital, I um, already had a job, but I appealed the thing when the, I filed an appeal for being fired and had a hearing and uh, the, which I was surprised, it, I showed up of course, and there was the employee, the uh, Department of Labor or whatever, whatever the, you know, guy, and then there was the uh, human resources director from the hospital. I was surprised anybody even showed up to contest the thing. But, uh, and I won that. They ruled that I, and I knew, of course, that I would win. There was no doubt about it because, well, I knew I was right. And I also knew that I had the documentation and everything, but I didn't try to get my job back. And uh, later now, I I can't verify this because I wasn't interested. I, I don't know it for a fact. I mean, I was told it by people that the, well, the director of security who fired me was not supposed to fire me. He had gone to administration, to the assistant administrator who was over security, and the uh, his boss told him, no, you cannot fire Jim. If you want to, you can... Uh, take away his supervisory, you know, position, which I had tried to, which I had stopped wearing my sergeant's insignia and told the director of security repeatedly I didn't want to be supervisor. He said, I need you, you know, it's crazy. The whole thing. But anyway, so, but anyway, he had gone to the assistant administrator of the hospital and the assistant administrator of the hospital had told him, no, you can't fire Jim. And he fired me anyway. And, of course, I knew on Friday that he had gone to administration to get me fired. And on Monday, you know, he, 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 he the uh, director of security was off Saturday and Sunday. On Monday, I came in. I knew I was going to be fired. And I was ready. Um, but if I would wanted to stop it, I could have just gone to the assistant administrator. And, or I could have gone to the administrator of the hospital and just said, hey, and I never went to the, ever went to the administrator of the hospital. Uh, one time when I was acting director of security because the other because the director of security was uh, laid up for some months with medical problem or something. I mean, I got called to the administrator's office once over because there was a multi-million dollar parking garage and structure hospital structure that was being turned over to us by the construction people and there was uh, some problem with locks or whatever. So I got called to talk on the phone to the construction to and the administrator's office. But the assistant administrator I had gone over that was over security, I had been to his office a few times. I did some grievances and he supposedly uh, 
I did four grievances and I won them all. And the last two times or whatever, the assistant administrator had to, he took heat from the administrator. I know that. And uh, because I was in the office and the human resources director was there and he had to come and you could tell he was pissed because he had to come. I mean, he'd been ordered to come there by the hospital administrator and uh, make sure everything was okay. And, uh, but I found out after I was fired that, uh, and this I can't verify 100%, but I was told by two or three people who worked at the hospital that uh, he was fired, the assistant administrator was fired because of everything. Because when I got fired, I did go, I had two choices. I could have gone to the, uh, I forget the name of the organization now, but basically it was uh, protection for minorities and, well, it was protections for everybody, but it generally was, you know, blacks or Hispanics or something like that. That's the organization, Equal Opportunity Employment. I forget the, the thing, but I went to the federal office and spent all morning, as soon as I got fired, I had the paperwork in the car and I drove over there. But that, all that information, see, I gave the guy, the lawyer just kept writing it down, right? And I had dates, times, things that had been said, everything. and. He said, which I knew before I went there, he says, uh, Jim, or maybe he said, Mr. Howard, I don't know. Uh, this is, you know, a great case. You have everything except the problem that I see is the fact that you are a supervisor and supervisors aren't covered under this. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm, I realized that. I said, well, I lied. <laughs> I said, no, I, I did not have the uh, authority to hire or fire, but I actually did have the authority to hire and fire. I actually did. Uh, but he says, yeah, I still, and of course, but all that information that he wrote down all went to the hospital. And so when the hospital administrator saw that, I think that's when he fired the assistant administrator of the hospital. But they didn't fire the director. He didn't fire the director of security. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, like I said, I never, I always was employed. And uh, I think I might have been lucky, you know. I went to... Well, like I mentioned once before, I, I keep saying I only went to, I actually went to a kindergarten, a public kindergarten, but for, I went to two Catholic grade schools and a Catholic high school. And of course, they were poor. And we were always collecting newspaper for newspaper drives, selling candy, all kind, you know, to make help with the. And my parents, of course, all our parents paid, you know, in addition to paying taxes for schools, which we didn't use, you know, our, my parents had to pay money to this, you know, school, Catholic school. But then, of course, I went to community, a couple of community colleges that were public later on. But I think that I have... Ha, or I have had, well, I had, and still probably have, something in my brain, in the wiring or something uh, different that put a couple strikes against me. Although I've done okay. I mean, I took, you know, I took the exam for the Peace Corps and passed it. In fact, I aced it. I mentioned that story one time. I didn't go in the Peace Corps though. I took the exam for the post office and passed it. I took the exam for the federal protective officer position, passed it. Uh, anyway, 
but something, not just my hearing. Now, my hearing, of course, in both ears was bad early, and that affected especially phonics. And I'm not sure they teach. I saw something, I think, on YouTube or read someplace. That, I mean, I always thought, well, like we used the books, Dick and Jane books, see Dick run, you know, see spot, that type of learn to read. And but with spelling and other things, I can remember sitting in, I don't know, second or third grade, whatever late grade you learned that in, and the nuns, you know, the nun was saying things, and the kids were hearing it, and I was hearing it, but not, you know, when they did it differently. I mean, and I think they may teach it differently now. So, terrible speller. I had to go to, I went to summer school five years in a row from my last year of grade school. St. Vincent sent me to Redemptorist High School to take, not high school class, but because I was a very, very poor speller. And when I went there, uh, the nun said to the group, the group that was there, you know, I was the only one that went from my school. Uh, you know, the reason you're poor spellers is because you don't read. If you read, you're a good, be a good speller. And I thought, wrong, sister, because I was a hell of a speller. I mean, a hell of a reader. And of course, I. During the summer, I'm, I'm guessing she would would finally must be sitting up there thinking, "What's this? What's this kid doing here?" You know, because I had no problem. I was. We didn't have the internet back then. I ordered books when I was in grade school and high school from the government printing office, military manuals and other kind of manuals that were printed, and would you know, I'd be reading uh, field manual such and such number on Arctic survival, a field manual on tropical survival, uh, you know, platoon tactics and just everything other, you know. But uh, there is something wrong if there's a, probably watching this maybe, school, because I never had the accident, at Catholic school, <laughs> we didn't have we didn't have cooking classes, and we didn't have shop classes, and uh, we didn't have counselors. I mean, the nuns were, but they were, you know, whacking you with a ruler or whatever. Um, so I have a problem undoubtedly with numbers. I've always had a trouble remembering numbers. That's that's why I was an early adopter of, in fact, I have one laying here. I have just a palm device. Where is that palm device? I could show it to you if I could remember where. I see it. Don't touch the mouse. Wasn't a very, that wasn't the very first one I had. I'm not sure if this, because this was the, um, no, you know something? I don't think this is a palm device because it says cellular. Yeah, I think this is, okay, this is an early cell phone, but it looks like the palm device. I had a number of the palm devices when they first came out through, yeah, this is a cell phone. Uh, anyway, I have a trouble, I still have a problem with numbers. And by the way, in my junior year of high school, they, we 
all the United States juniors, and the Republicans may have done away with that because it would be government control or whatever, but nationwide, every junior would take on the same day a uh, national scholarship exam or something like that. And uh, they actually printed, this was before, well, there were printers, I mean, there were computers, but, well, there weren't computers like this or anything, you know, but we're talking like 1958, yeah, junior in high school. Anyway, uh, I got back the report, and it showed a graph and had numbers and all that kind of stuff, multi-pages. And it showed average. I mean, you know, the thing went, and I was like, average. And because they give you numbers, how you compared with your school, how you compared, I think maybe state, and how you compared nationwide or something like that. Maybe it was just, I don't know, anyway. So, I mean, to me, I came out the middle, or, you know, average or whatever. I was fine with that. <clears throat> but then I looked at it, and it was graphed, you know, and the line went <sighs> down like that. My God! And it was like 98% or 95% of the juniors in the United States and in my school or whatever were better at that subject than I was. And I was like, what in the hell? And it was mathematics. 95% of the juniors in the United States were better at mathematics than I was. And I thought, oh, this is, I didn't realize, that, you know, this is not good. I knew I flunked algebra and had to go to summer school for it. But I also flunked typing. I flunked religion. I flunked everything. But then I looked, and at the top, it was like I was 5% from the top. I was 95% better than every junior in the United States in the ability to comprehend and read and understand material and draw correct conclusions and something the effect of, you know, tell what's true and not from the material. And I thought, wow, I'll, <coughs> I thought, I I'll take that. <laughs> uh, I thought, That's good, you know. <coughs> of course, when I got out of high school and I could not get into the military because I was 40 pounds under the minimum weight requirement. And then I tried again to get in the military and I couldn't get in. And then I thought, what would I like to do? And I thought, oh, I'd like to be, it wasn't a computer technician or a uh, electronic. It was like, back then it was radio TV repair. That was, and I thought, wow, I'd like to be a radio TV repair. Then I thought, oh my God, Ohm's Law. Uh, you know, wattage and resistance and whatever. I can't make it as can't make it as an electronic technician. But many, many years, the hospital that I was fired from <clears throat> back in the 1970s, and I did four grievances against the director of security, and I won all of them. Uh, and he was putting in. That's one reason that when I went, when I got fired, and then I. I, he gave me uh, fantastic reviews. And he put in his review, you know, like the one before he fired me, they put in that when he got promoted, of course, I told him, you're never going to be, he thought he was going to be promoted. Uh, I, and I, I told him, you know, you're not, not going to be promoted. You're lucky you're not fired. You're not going to be promoted to assistant administrator. But he put in there that I should get his job as director of security. And then the 
last review, just before he fired me, he put in again, of course, every box as high as you could be, you know, give give somebody and put in there that, and he had talked to me about, I told him I, I want out, you know, I cannot take you anymore. I can't, and I explained what, you know, he knew what it was, you know, I just can't take it anymore. And I want out and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know, but I just got to get out of here. You're driving me crazy. And uh, he said, what are your interests or whatever? And I said, well, computers and shortwave radio and electronics. And he says, oh, you should be in the biomed department here. And he arranged, and I said, well, yeah. And he arranged with, and it went into my merit, my last merit review just before I got fired, that as soon as there was an opening in the biomed department, the people who, and uh, I had to interview, of course, with the guy in charge of the biomed department, and he approved me to be, and so it was in my merit review that as soon as an opening became available, and, uh, but I just couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't make it. It was like data, they, the guy in charge of, the real nice guy that was in charge of the biomed department would have to come to security in the mornings to pick up the key to his department to go to his department or whatever. And I would, when I was there, I'd be, I forget his name now. I said, and he said, Jim, hang on. He says, there's three or four guys in the department that are looking to move to other, you know, move up to better jobs or whatever. And I said, hurry. <laughs> I couldn't last. Couldn't last it out. I just couldn't make it. The uh, long story. Sometime I really got to go into detail with. But you know what I was thinking? Okay, uh, that brought up something that I had forgotten that I wanted to mention and then I'll stop this. Uh, stop this thing. I was just, in fact, I think a short time ago in a video, maybe a couple of videos, I sort of talked about this, the job that I had at Trinity Lutheran Hospital and the director of security. And I said that how intelligent he was, the director of security, and what a great administrator he was when it came to paperwork and all that kind of stuff. But he could not handle people. And then I think I said in one of my videos or more that the guy was, a, I think, a colonel, or I think it was a major in the uh, military. And I, how could you be not, of course, from reading um, things on that quota thing and other places, oh, watching also YouTube videos about the military, now I can understand that, uh, you know, somebody goes to the military as an officer, and uh, thank God they have sergeants and, you know, NCOs to handle the kind of things because they probably can't handle the things because, it, in a way, I just saw it repeatedly. But he was also, oh, he was racist big time, and that's where we were having our clashes uh, over that. And really, that's the reason I was fired. He gave a different reason, but that was a, it was clearly the reason that I was fired. Um because there was a lot of stuff going on, and I had worked to correct the situation. But, oh, that's what I was, okay, I'm getting sidetracked. Anyway, he also, I mentioned, I think, in a recent video, that, oh, I think there was a discussion or something on the news, or else I just brought it up to y'all, the fact that, the part of the, would that be Air Force or would that be Army? Air Force, I think. The people who handled the missiles and stuff like that, that it came out, their big old scandal and a scary one. Uh, you know, they have to be highly trained and certified and recertified and on procedures or whatever, and it turned out that they were fake. They were uh, cheating on the test, 
and not things were not being handled because uh, it was orders came down from above and it was just basically you know, like impossible to comply instead of saying hey we don't have enough trained certified people to certify these other people or we don't have time to send these people or whatever they just okay you know they want the paperwork so we just so they're doing that kind of stuff and uh so then i thought oh okay oh and then I, well, that's what it was man how can you lie about something like you know nuclear launch codes and and things like that and then i thought you know this director of security that i worked for he was highly intelligent but what i never understood and he, but he couldn't handle you know little issues and uh, also the fact that that he was he lied he lied big time he lied about things that 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 did not make sense because like our current you know president he lied about things that everybody would know it was a lie. Everybody would, it would be found out that it was a lie. And he would lie about, lying about, it was just, and I thought, what in the world? And then I thought, maybe that was because of the, but he was in, of course, the army. He was in the military police. And even, I even know he was in the, because uh, I had a cousin that was there. Not that the cousin knew him, but. He was in the military police that was over moving in Germany or something, the atomic cannon. Not sure we should have had atomic cannons, you know. Missiles are bad enough, but at least I don't think we had atomic hand grenades. I hope not. Um, but so I thought, okay, very intelligent, but lies about everything. Um the four grievances that I did before, and I knew I was going to get fired if I didn't get tra if I didn't get that job right away in uh, biotech. I knew I was going to, or I have to quit. So at, after being there like five and a half years, almost six years, I went to the personnel department there at the hospital. It had a, actually had a great. Um, director of the Human Resources Department. Really great guy. Uh, so anyway, I said, I, I'd like to look at my my file. I understand that's my right. And a Human Resources, uh, well, anyway, he came over, Vernon Johnson, and he said, now, Jim, you know, one of us will have to sit with you while you look at it. I said, I, I don't have any problem with that. I'm, that's, I understand fully. So I looked through my file. I was really shocked. I was expecting, now I'm sure up in the security office, <laughs> the director of security probably had a file on me with all types of crap in there. But down in the human resources file, there wasn't anything in that file that I did not know about. There was, you know, my employment application that I filled out. There was two or three letters of commendation that I had received from, uh, patients or visitors for assisting them pay my pay my merit reviews and there was four things in there that I was that I had never seen or was not aware of and that was the investigation or the report that the director of human resources did on each one of my merit reviews and the or my each one of my grievances and the first grievance that I did I probably, and I won't even bug you with the rest of them uh, until some other time, probably. The first one was the director of security got upset because the midnight shift sergeant apparently was not coming in when it snowed or something like that, something like that. So the director of security wrote in red a, a memo and put it on our bulletin board in our security office saying that any security officer who misses one day of work will have to bring in a doctor's excuse. And, and too, when he wrote it, he wrote it in red. But 
which, you know, and then he also, the way he wrote it, you know, it's like, and so I saw that, I come out, and there he is, you know, coming down the hall, and I said, Mr. Ross, I just saw that, you know, and he said, uh, now, Jim, that doesn't apply to you, that applies to, I forget who it was, it was a midnight shift supervisor, and he said, because he, and I said, well, this goes against hospital policy. I said, if you want to talk to the midnight shift supervisor and say, hey, I see a pattern here, and it looks to me like that you're not coming in when it snows or whatever, and then you want to put some rule in effect for him, I don't have a problem with that. I said, I don't know about the hospital, but I don't have a problem with it, and I don't think the hospital will. But you can't put that out, out for the entire department and he says, I can do anything in my department. If you don't like it, you can get out. And he went, and then he took off. And I knew he was, well, I figured he was going to, and he maybe did, because he always did. I thought he was heading for administration. But apparently he went directly to Human Resources, the personnel department. And Mr. Vernon Johnson, I found out, told him, well, I found out before that because, on the grievance, but anyway, from this thing, Mr. Johnson said, you know, that, uh, you know, Bob Ross came to my office and said he was going to put, that he put this policy into effect, and and uh, I told him that that went against hospital policy. He said he was going to do it, that he ran his department, and I said, hospital policy is hospital policy. It doesn't matter that your men are in uniform. It doesn't matter that they're armed. They're in hospital employees, and you can, that just cannot do this. And he says, I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, so anyway, this was it. Oh, yeah. And then he said that uh, Mr. Ross said that Jim Howard was the, the reason I had to put this into effect because of his absenteeism. And uh, Mr. Johnson uh the, you know, he looked up my record, and it was, you couldn't be any better of a record. And what's kind of funny is, I mean, that kind of shows that the director of security wasn't too smart. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I guess before he went to school and got a degree, I'm guessing in human resources, was a railroad engineer. There's a John Wayne movie, by the way, where... Uh, during the Civil we'll be during the Civil War, and a woman asks, he says he's an engineer, you know, and she says, oh, that must be, you know, pulling, the, he said, no, a railroad, in, you know, but he was a, a engineer for the, you know, Vernon Johnson was in, and he would tell people, that was when, when he, employees got together, I used to be a railroad engineer. The trains have to run on time, the train has to, I sometimes would have to, I forget what story we tell, you know, I, <laughs> I had to walk through blizzards for a hundred miles. I had to leave, you know, whatever it was. It was, you know, but I believe him. <laughs> and so, uh, to Vernon Johnson, that man, my, he's, you know, Mr. Johnson, but my record was excellent, which it was. And then I found out that every time something would come up on my, like my grievances that, uh, Bob Ross, the director of uh, security, would say, you know, that I was the reason or something. Or he would just lie about, he lied about things like, uh, he came up with, he always had these great ideas, not great ideas, he always had ideas, director of security did. And so he called in all four of the supervisors. I was uh, second shift supervisor. No, it had been three supervisors, yeah. I was second shift supervisor. He called in the midnight shift supervisor and he called in the day shift supervisor. And he said, I have got this great idea. We are gonna save the hospital a lot of money. We're gonna take over doing the snow removal. This is gonna be great, you know, uh, We'll get a new vehicle because we're going to do the snow removal 
and blah, blah, blah. And then, then of course, <laughs> the director of security was pretty, you know, he calls on the day shift supervisor and asks her, what do you, oh, great idea, Mr. Ross, great idea. Then he asked the, uh, no, I think there was an extra. Yeah, there was, four supervisor. Then he calls on the uh, lieutenant who worked the day shift also. Oh, Mr. and Mr. and man, the lieutenant was, oh, wow. I mean, they, the hospital department heads and everything called the lieutenant Mr. Ross's whipping boy. Anyway. Uh, anyway, called on him. Oh, great idea, Mr. Ross. Then he called on the midnight shift sergeant, or a midnight shift sergeant, yeah. Lloyd Akins, Lloyd Akins. Oh, great idea. Then he calls on me. And I said, I don't think it's a good idea. And then I spelled out why, you know. We can't do two jobs well, you know. We can be security officers or we can be shoveling snow or plowing snow or putting out gravel or sand or whatever, but we can't do both. And we should just let them keep, you know, we get a vehicle. And then he talks some more, and then he comes around again, ask each one of them, comes to me, bad idea. And so it was actually several months before the winter came around. And, uh, of course, I was right, like I always, you know. Winter comes around, uh coming down like and two that was the worst part of Kansas City Missouri that was the area was called Hospital Hill we you know you think of Kansas City Missouri or whatever you know that was a hilly area hospital set on top of the hill it was it was every and two we'd had some pretty mild winters and we had a contract with a company home lawn and garden I think we'd call them they'd be right over they'd take care of the snow so we took the snow bolt doing anyway. And so I was on duty when we got our first snow coming down like a son of a bitch. And I told the uh, other, I said, you know, you know, stay inside and I forget who the other, you know, the other, I and the other guy will go outside. And the other, the other guy, Jim, no, let's all do it. You know, we'll pitch in. So we all three go outside. We're out there doing what we can in the snow. I hear the radio clicking or whatever, and I step inside the lobby because of the switchboard operator also was the dispatcher. She said, uh, administ the admitting lady over there says somebody is has a handful of prescriptions or whatever, trying to, and I go over there and, the lady over there that then says he went to the pharmacy. This is night, by the way, you know, nine or ten o'clock at night. And uh, I went to pharmacy, and the pharmacist says, but then I got the call from the switchboard operator, number 10 door alarm, which was, a, you know, right down the end by administration, going outside on the sidewalk. I go down there. The guy's out in the street off a of hospital property. When you went out that door, you crossed the sidewalk, and you were in the street. You were off hospital property. And so anyway, I'm out the door, and I said, uh, Sir, can I help you? No, no. I said, uh, Were you trying to get a prescription filled or something? Yeah, yeah. I said, Come on over here on hospital property. I can help you. So he came on over, and I put the handcuffs on him. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, you know, he had come into the hospital, while we were outside doing snow removal, went to the emergency room. They knew nothing was wrong with the guy. They put him back in a room to get to him later on or something. He filled these pockets up with uh, prescription pads they had in there. Not a good idea to leave prescription pads, you know. That was against hospital policy to leave prescription pads laying there, you know. But anyway, he stuffed his pocket full of prescription pads, and then he tried filling one out, <laughs> and then he went to admitting, to, can I get this filled, and they told you know, and that's how he ended up going to jail. 
So anyway, I wrote it up. And then the next day, the director of security, oh, Jim, you guys did a great job on that arrest last night. And I said, I to and I explained, you know, we were, he was perfectly happy. We did the snow and we arrested the guy. So, but anyway, he, you know, I, I got sidetracked again. Anyway, he, the director of security lied about so many things and bizarre. So I was in a video not long ago saying, well, you know, I worked for this guy who was in the military, had been in the military, and super intelligent, but he lied about everything. He lied about everything the way Trump lies about everything. But... Um, you know, this director of security was really smart, but he lied about everything. But not like Trump that lies about everything, who's not smart. Um, but then I was watching something like last week or whatever, watched several things, and... There was, I don't know whether the guy was, he was, well, there's a couple of different people. I'd kind of seen one before, I think, or it was actually a different person. But one was a psychiatrist, and then one was a college professor who taught psychology or something like that. And what they, and especially the one guy, one guy wrote a book on Trump. And not a flattering one, by the way. And the other guy had done a study with other professors or scholarly people about Trump, looking at his, looking back at all the information they had on, on him, speeches that he made a long time ago long before he had any political ambitions, you know, business things, uh, whatever. And they said, and these, these people weren't on the same show or this is separate videos or something. But what they were saying was, well, uh, Donald Trump, years ago, we have video and audio and speeches and everything that he had made, and he was using a, the vocabulary of somebody who was a graduate from an Ivy League college, uh, an educated man. And his organization, his speeches, everything, they were good. But now... It, it's degraded to such a degree that is unbelievable. And uh, and so you know their their conclusion is that Trump has cosmic cosmic. That's <laughs> not it. There's cosmic. No. Anyway, mentally he's. Not Alzheimer's, maybe not dementia, but screwed up. He needs he need, he needs not to be president because of his inability to think and comprehend and understand and properly behave. So then, what I was thinking was, you know, Bob Ross, the director of security that fired me. By the way, I liked him, but one reason I liked him, he was racist. And I was not racist. I was the exact opposite. Also, he was uh, pretending or he trying to, the persona of being important. And, and that was, that, the, I'm the exact opposite. That upsets me. So he had so much conflict. But I admit he, Oh, he did fantastic merit reviews <laughs> on me, and 
but there was also I under, had some understanding about him. Uh, we never talked about it, and I I don't think he even told me. I think maybe his wife did. Uh, that he was an orphan and he didn't know who his mother and father were, and he had spent a lot of time trying to find them, and he couldn't, you know. And then other things she mentioned to to me one not it's not I think that's the only time I ever met her. I mean, I saw her coming occasionally to pick him up or whatever. But that time she, I was out in the parking lot. She was out there, and then we talked, and I could tell she said. Uh, I forget exactly what she said because it, this was like in the seventies, but something to the you know the effect of she knew that him and I had problems because I'm sure he went home and probably took it out on her. I mean, I don't mean hit her or yell at her or anything like that, but I mean probably went home and said, "Why is you know why is Jim doing this to me?" You know. Uh, she said, "You know, uh, you know, we were in the military and." outside the United States a lot, and, you know, we never had a nice house, and we just had a house on base or something like that, and we didn't have a, you know, because he had a Cadillac that he bought, and she was standing there by it. Oh, I think that's what she knew, you know, she, because uh, she said something to me, and I said, uh, uh, Mr. Ross's just out here, I'll give him a call. He was showing his car to people. He parked his car out there, and not just that day, but all the day, you know, he went and brought department heads and people out to see his car, and I'm thinking, you know, that's not, but to him, he that seemed okay. Uh, but anyway, she said, you know, well, yeah, we didn't have much money when they were in the military and whatever, so... Anyway, um, I was going to mention something. Anyway, oh, I know what it was. I haven't got to the point yet. So, Mr. Ross had these characteristics, but nowhere like, and too, he was racist. Not just against blacks, which he was really racist against blacks, because I could tell you some things. Man, we went round and round over that. Uh, we had some gypsy. I, I, you know, it's just fairly recently that I under, that I found out that you're not supposed to call gypsies gypsies. You're supposed to call them Roma. I mentioned that in, I think, a video back. I was actually watching a movie, or was it that uh, sort of Irish BBC, yeah, well, not maybe not a BBC, but uh, anyway, but in a, in a movie and then in a TV show, they were mentioned. And the first time they were doing it, like Roma, you know, like these people coming, uh, settled with their caravan, little their traveling thing, and and they fimp the field there, you know, and uh, the dad says, oh, yeah, they're Roma to the boy, Roma. And then I found out that you're not supposed to call gypsies gypsies. That's like calling them the N-word or something, I guess. So, anyway, we had a gypsy family that uh, checked into the hospital. And, oh, my God, the director, well, the director of security went around the hospital. He told the people, the volunteers, gray-haired the white-haired, the silver-haired ladies that worked in the gift shop. Oh, if these gypsies, they'll steal your, you know, they'll steal from you. If, if if one of the gypsies come here, you call security to come down and watch them. And, and sure enough, I got a call to go down because the, a gypsy, a Roma, was in the gift shop. I got called to go down to the cafeteria. I went down there. And the uh, employee in the, oh, the gypsy boy over there, he took a hand, he took that many napkins and left with them, you know, out of the napkin dispenser. And then about that time, the uh, 
Mr. Ross, the director of security, I was, I don't know if he called me up or I went by and he says, uh, go bring the uh, leaders of the gypsies up here. I want to talk to them. So I went down, a couple guys in business suits, you know. One of them was a Wyandotte County deputy sheriff. I took them up to the office and and I took him up and I started to leave and Mr. Ross said, no, stay, Jim. Uh, he wanted to show me how he was going to handle them. And then he tells him, I know how you gypsies are and you have your taking, you know, you have your taking ways and whatever. I was in the military in Germany and, uh, and I thought, please, let me just, can I just become invisible, you know? But anyway, I, I think I mentioned, well, this director of security that I worked for, a very smart man, but very racist, and, and he lied, lied big time. But he's not like Mr. He's not like Donald Trump. Donald Trump lies, but he's not smart. Well, then I saw this material about Trump. Maybe, apparently, looking at his past up until a certain point, being an educated person, being able to make speeches, being able to be coherent, uh, different than he is now. And then I was thinking, you know, I got fired from Trinity in about 1980 or something like that. And I didn't see that, see Bob Ross after that. Uh, but years later, maybe 90, something like that, the hospital that I worked for had formed a corporation and ended up taking over in Kansas City like 11 other hospitals, including the hospital that I used to work at. And so then the director of security at the hospital that I worked at actually became basically over these other 11 hospitals because that was the corporation headquarters hospital or whatever. And I had that director of security say, Jim, you used to work at, you know, Trinity Lutheran Hospital, yeah. Do you know? And so then I, you know, I said, highly intelligent, you know, but I better warn you, he, his dream was always to be in charge of the job that you now have, or whatever. I said, but he's highly intelligent. If 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 you can use him when it comes to fire, to, uh, you know, OSHA regulations and fire and safety, and if you need manuals and that kind of stuff drawn up, but he doesn't, he has a real difficulty in handling rank and file people. He just can't do that. But highly intelligent, if you can use him, use him. And uh, so then I was working at, you know, research hospital. And in fact, I actually got sent over to the hospital that I got fired from. <laughs> And uh, it was on a weekend or whatever, and I was out. I think it was. I think it was because of Fourth of July, and they were having the Liberty Memorial Mall was right next, and they were having the Spirit Fourth of July festival, and they needed extra security. And I went over. I didn't see Mr. Ross or hard. I was just out in the parking lot or something like that. But uh, but kind of funny, you know. Um, but then, so we were having our officers go over there uh, to fill in and do stuff like that. And they came back, different ones came back. Jim, you know, you used to work. Well, how could you work for that guy, that, the director of security over there? He's so stupid and crazy. And I said, no, he's not a very smart man. No, he's stupid. And I said, no, he's, I didn't say any of that at all. Uh, and they said, I remember one, they said, well, what about his gun policy? And I said, what about the gun policy? And they said, well, his policy over there is that the security officers 
are to shoot to wound. They're to shoot the gun out of somebody's hand or shoot them in the arm or the leg. And I said, no, oh, that's, in, that's insane. He wouldn't have that. That's his policy. It's written. And I said, I, he must be must be mentally ill. I said, that, that doesn't, because, and then they came back, you know, some, oh, what about, and they mentioned that, that that's, that's crazy. So, uh, then I ended up a year or two later working at one of the small hospitals we had taken over, that Health Midwest had taken over, Lee Summit Hospital, and, uh, at night, I, you know, security had the key to pharmacy, and the head nurse had the key to pharmacy. It took both keys to get in. She couldn't get in just with her key, and I couldn't get in just with my key. So we'd have to go back, and sometimes we'd have to go back, sometimes a bunch of times, you know, to go in there to get some medication that's the ER or someplace else. So we were in there, and we'd, we'd talk and everything, and she said, uh, you used to work at Trinity, and she says, yeah, and she said, she says, so did you know Bob Bross? And I said, yeah, he fired me. And she said, well, I got him fired. And uh, she said, you know, when they closed Trinity Lutheran Hospital, they kept the psych unit open, and I was in charge of the psych unit. And so she said, and I forget what she said he did. You know, he was, it was that sounded crazy, doing bizarre stuff. And she said, I... I was a psych nurse, and she says, I wrote up, you know, uh, my diagnosis, you know, of what was wrong, and she says, they, they fired him. So now what I'm wondering about is, you know, Bob Ross, smart, racist, but smart, really smart, articulate, everything, and... Many years later, apparently really screwed up, and then we have Donald Trump, who, according to these professors, and I'm not sure if a guy was a psychiatrist, if he was a psychiatrist, he was a, I can't remember now, Donald Trump, articulate, maybe smart, uh, I think he'd have been flawed, but anyway, because of his upbringing and stuff, but still. Now, so I just happened to not be dealing with Bob Ross, and maybe, maybe he ends up in the same situation. My mother you know, you know, passed away, died from Alzheimer's. We were, uh, which I don't think, you know, Ronald, President Reagan had Alzheimer's, but, and I think he had it while he was President of the United States, but Republicans deny that. Uh, but we were really lucky in a number, well, my mother, before the Alzheimer's hit her, just stayed at home. She never tried to get, she never went before the Alzheimer's hit. She stayed at home. So luckily when the Alzheimer's hit, she didn't try to leave. We didn't have to worry about her leaving. We just had to worry about her making sure she didn't, you know, start a fire or whatever. And two, we were really lucky that my daughter Hillary moved in with her and was there to take care of her. And, uh, but, you know, Trump doesn't have Alzheimer's. I'm not sure he has, well, I'm not an expert on it. I'm not an expert on anything. But he doesn't have, well, you can watch, if I find the links to those things, but if you're a, if you're a Trump supporter, well, you're probably already gone, probably never started watching this video, and if you did start watching the video when I got to this point, you probably left a long time ago. But um,
I, man, I hope that I don't, hope I don't end up with, I'll be 80, no, Ugh. I'll be 78, I think, this month. For my family's sake, I hope I do not get Alzheimer's. That's what, you know, working hospitals for 30 years. I don't know how many times I was called by nursing to go up to the floor of the hospital to try to deal with somebody that had, you know, had Alzheimer's. It was a patient there. And a couple times, and I was really lucky on one or two occasions, I was, one time I was outside, like two or three o'clock in the morning, and a, I think it was a female, if I remember correct, came out, came down a fire exit, and you know, it was an enclosed fire exit, but came down and popped out right there, and it was cold, it was wintertime, colder than hell, and there was 71 Highway just in front of it, well, there was an Outer Belt Road, and 71 Highway out there, and she came out, and I could, took her back up, and then there was once I was sitting, they had rearranged things, they had our security office, uh, I don't, don't, don't get me started on that, but they'd moved our security office, well, let me start on that, when that hospital was built, new hospital, small hospital, they had the security office right there, there was two offices, one for the head nurse for the ER and one for us right there at the door. I went, there was just two of us, one on, not at the same time. Two of us were sent out there. They didn't have security around the clock. I told the other officer, Fletch, we have to hold on to this office. Everybody's going to want this office. We have to do everything we can to make sure we hold on to this office. And uh, then anyway, the head ER doctor, who was in charge of the ER. And keep in mind, too, we were not there during this. We didn't have security during the daytime. He said, Jim, uh, would it be okay with you if I used your office since you're not here during the daytime? And I said, no, it wouldn't be. What? I said, no, it wouldn't be. I, I don't want you using the office because this is a perfect place for us. If you start using the office, before long you're going to have the office. Before long we won't have the office. This is the perfect place. Right there is the ER door. We're right here now. And then, of course, I get a memo eventually that he's going to be using the office. Then before long we get a memo that uh, the office belongs to the ER doctor. And uh, then that's when they get build us an office in a hallway between the hospital and the medical building that faced the other security officer kind of liked it because at that time there was one road coming into the hospital and our office was right there and he liked it I didn't like it but anyway I was sitting there one time because I I would go over there and do my activity sheet or whatever and then go back to the emergency room or whatever but I was there and pop two or three o'clock in the morning winter time or whatever maybe I don't think it was the same lady uh, comes out and I go out there and take her back upstairs but then eventually what happened when we got our got a new eventually new director of security is over by where the two offices were there was an area there where they pushed wheelchairs or whatever he came he arranged they built us a platform up so that we would be higher up than people that we could look down and it had um, you know a door and uh, it was an office for us right there, and so we we got that. But uh, anyway, I sure hope that I do not end up with Alzheimer's for my family's sake. That is, <clears throat> where I lived there, and when I lived in Belton, lived in a mobile home in a nice. I'd come into work at the hospital, and uh, the ER nurses or or somebody would say, oh, well, you know, all we've had today is trailer trash. Oh, Jim, oh, we did mean you. Yeah, you live in a nice, you live in, you know, Springdale Lake. That You live in a nice place. So, yeah, <laughs> and I'd act like it, you know, until it, 
Uh, but uh, anyway, we lived at the in the trailer park there. A guy across the from us was a decorated. I didn't really. I mean, I said talked to him a few times, but it, but uh, my son talked to him quite a bit. He was a decorated uh, World War II veteran, and uh, his wife had Alzheimer's. And it was once or twice that I saw her outside with her nightgown on, with her head down the road, you know, or whatever. And I went out, and then I think my son uh, James, I think he went out there and caught her a few times too. And eventually, her husband it broke his heart, but he put her in a nursing home. And then she died almost immediately, going after she went to the nursing home. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. And uh, trying to think if I'm going. No, I'm not going to add any. I was going to add that page, those pages to the. I'll do something like that later on. So uh, I guess if you're not subscribed. Please subscribe.